is war. War and its masses. War and its men. War and its machines. Together they form the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. The big picture is a report to you from your army. An army committed by you, the people of the United States, to stop communist aggression wherever it may strike. The big picture traces the course of events in the Korean campaign through first-hand reports of our combat veterans and through film produced by the Army Signal Corps, photographed by combat cameramen. These are the men who daily record on film the big picture as it happens, where it happens. Today, the big picture will show our United Nations forces crossing the 38th parallel. You'll see our paratroopers land near Monsan. You'll see Republic of Korea troops in action. You'll see the strength of an infantry tank team. And from another part of the world, from Europe, the activation of shape and the message from General Eisenhower. And later in our program, you will hear from two Army soldiers from the 1st Cavalry Division, Warrant Officer Sam Putterbaugh and Private First Class Jim Vines. But now for part of the big picture, let's go back to March 20th, 1951. As of 20 March, UN ground forces on all fronts are pushing slowly and methodically northward toward the 38th parallel. They meet only light resistance as the Chinese communists fall back. On 21 March, Chun Chon falls without a fight. In an attempt to speed up the offensive and trap the large enemy force guarding the approaches to Pyongyang, the 187th Regimental Combat Team parachutes behind enemy lines in the Munsan area just 12 miles below the parallel. At the same time, other UN forces drive northward along a 15-mile front above Seoul to meet them. However, the main body of the communist troops escaped the trap. By 31 March, South Korean forces in the east have already crossed the parallel and are moving inland from Yongyong. In the west, a US tank column crosses the 38th parallel north of Seoul. Meanwhile, UN naval forces patrol the East Korean waters, harassing enemy transport and troop movements along the coast, and bombarding key communist traffic hubs. Allied ground troops continue their cautious advance into enemy territory, and on 18 April, after days of bloody fighting, UN troops in the central sector capture the strategic Hwachon Dam and enter the town of Hwachon. As of 20 April, the Chinese communists are continuing to fall back all along the front with heavy casualties. But their resistance becomes stronger as UN troops approach the huge enemy concentrations that have been massed below Wan San for the long-expected counter-offensive. During this 30-day period, the greatest aerial battle of the Korean War took place with over 225 bombers and fighters involved. Eight enemy jets are destroyed no friendly fighters are lost. On this map of Korea, a crudely improvised tomahawk marks the jump area for a parachute operation beyond our front lines. The airborne mission is named Operation Tomahawk. Objective? to seize an area deep in enemy territory on the Imjin River near Munsan and hold on until ground forces move up to consolidate the position. Equipment of the parachutist gets a pre-loading inspection. Any loose dangling gear may injure the jumper or snap off and get lost when the chute opens. 3,300 parachutists of the 187th Regimental Combat Team will participate in the operation. Into the C-119 flying boxcars, heavy equipment is loaded. 4.2-inch mortars, 
105 millimeter howitzers and jeeps are prepared for the drop to support the parachute infantrymen. Air Force crew members get last minute briefings. Pilots carefully recheck jump areas on maps, get latest weather report, and then prepare to take off. Troop carrier planes rendezvous over Tegu and fly northward. Fighters and bombers have preceded these planes to soften up enemy resistance. Here's the jump area, 10 miles south of the parallel. At 0900 on Good Friday, 23 March, Brigadier General Frank S. Bowen's 187th Airborne RCT hits the silk over the rice paddies and rolling terrain of the jump area. The parachutists leave the troop carriers in sticks of 42 men from each plane at an altitude of 800 feet. As soon as all parachute personnel have jumped, the flying boxcars start delivering the heavy equipment. In this plane, jeeps and trailers are being dropped. A small parachute is released to aid in pulling the heavy cargo from the plane. More equipment and supplies are dropped as the parachutists quickly assemble and organize on the ground. The North Korean First Corps, believed to be in this area, had vanished. No serious opposition was encountered. Operation Tomahawk gains 20 miles in one day. Just before nightfall, the first tanks of the 24th Infantry Division link up with the parachutists. Tank drivers poke their heads up through their ports to have a look around. The task force reorganizes and moves out. This was Korea in March 1951. The 24th Division was pushing the Chinese back across the 38th parallel. Let's have a report from another part of our ground team now. Here is Private First Class Jim Vines of Beckley, West Virginia. Jim saw action with his 7th Regiment of the 1st Cavalry Division. Well, where was the 7th at this time, Jim? We was also moving northward toward the 38th parallel. We crossed the Han River. We were stopped there on the we couldn't get supplies in and flooded and washed all the bridges out. We had to have our supplies dropped in by air. As soon as we got supplied up, we moved on northward across the 38th into the Washington Reservoir. Well, what happened up there, Jim? Well, we, we ran into pretty stiff resistance up there. They opened up the flood gates, flooded us out, and washed all of our supplies away again. It took us 11 days to secure it. They had plenty rough, didn't they? Sure did. Well, Jim, I see you're wearing the Bronze Star. How did you get that? Well, it was on the Naktong River before we started our first push north. It, uh, the battalion was under a, about a four-hour attack one morning. It was short on ammunition, my company was. A jeep driver had got hit that morning, so I volunteered to take the jeep and go back to the supply point, which I had to go through about two mile of road that was under heavy enemy fire to get to the supply point, and I made two trips hauling ammunition up to the company. It was awarded to me there. Mm-hmm. Did they keep you on a Jeep driver then, Jim? Yes, sir. I drove a Jeep the rest of the time in Corey. I guess they figured this guy Vines can really carry the mail. To carry the mail is one of the things you did do, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Carrying mail, rations. You were very Clean clothing. Very popular man, Jim. Well, let's get back and talk about these hills in Korea once again. It's pretty hard to get these Chinese out of their holes, wasn't it? Yes, sir. They dig in so deep that most of them didn't even get out. Just kill them right in their hole. Well, what's one of the best weapons to get them out, Jim? About the only thing you can get down into them is napalm. Burn them out. Well, how close to our lines do they drop that stuff? Well, I've seen it dropped in closest to 100 yards. Sometimes probably closer. But it's good for the morale to see it come down, huh? Sure is. Well, Jim, uh, you saw plenty of napalm drops in Korea. Let's watch now as napalm helps the 24th Division in their advance. While foot troops move up, tactical air makes a coordinated strike against the enemy's hastily constructed fortified positions in the hills.
jets deliver one of the most feared of our weapons, napalm bombs. These jelly gasoline bombs have proved highly successful in flushing the enemy from prepared positions. With air and artillery preparation completed, riflemen take up the assault and overrun the enemy's defensive lines before the communists can recover from the shock of the bombardment. This assault moves the United Nations forces one step closer to the communist violated border of the Republic of Korea. The enemy increases his defensive fires, resisting stubbornly, sometimes fanatically, as the area of the 38th parallel becomes a battleground for the fourth time since the war started last June. A rifle platoon passes through an area burned out by napalm bombs. The only enemy found in this area was charred. An automatic rifleman spots a target of opportunity and opens fire. And a 3.5-inch bazooka team is engaged in neutralizing defensive positions. And, as always, there is just one more hill to take before the assault is completed. After the objective is overrun and the units reorganize, the men fight off the chill of the mountain climate. The serpentine route of the Imjin River creates a land pocket with a natural water barrier on three sides near the 38th parallel. Communist elements withdrew across this river after abandoning Seoul without a fight. Here on the south bank of the river, units of the 1st ROK Division prepare to cross the Imjin. South Korean troops assemble for the Imjin crossing while their combat engineers bring up the assault boats. Brigadier General Pike Sun Yup, commanding general of the 1st ROK Division, supervises the operation which was planned by his staff officers. Areas suspected of containing hostile forces are plotted by artillerymen. The South Koreans request a fire mission from U.S. forces to support the river crossing. The mission is coordinated and artillery pieces fire as requested. Immediately following the softening up artillery fire in the area north of the Imjin, the ROK troops load into assault boats and paddle across the river as enemy small arms fire harasses the operation. Enemy forces on the north bank, scouted earlier by a patrol, are estimated to be in company strength. This crossing is being made near the site where the main allied supply road spanned the Imjin last year when United Nations forces were fighting in the Pyongyang area to the north. United Nations liaison officers observe the activities as the river crossing is executed. The Imjin is crossed successfully against ineffective resistance from North Koreans and elements of the Chinese Third Field Army. In the shadow of Paris's famed Arc de Triomphe, General of the Army Dwight D. Eisenhower takes command of Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe at his temporary headquarters in the Hotel Astoria. SHAPE is a functional unit of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. For many months, 
The nations of NATO have been engaged in erecting for themselves a wall of security against any possible aggression. They have no aggressive intent or purpose of their own. They intend only to see to it that they may live peaceably and secure uh, behind the arrangements that they collectively make. Today, another significant step was taken in this process of ensuring our collective security. This headquarters, formally and officially, assumed operational control and command of all forces allocated by our several countries to the defense of Europe. General Eisenhower executes the first order issued by SHAPE. By signing this historic document, the general assumes formal command of all allied land, sea, and air organizations assigned to him by NATO. On a 60-acre plot of Marley Forest, which has been cleared in this area, construction of a permanent headquarters for SHAPE is begun. This location, 20 miles west of Paris, was once a secluded retreat for Louis XIV, who built an ornate palace here. In contrast to the king's palace, the new shape buildings will be modest, constructed of prefabricated materials to house 600 military and civilian headquarters personnel. Foundations are poured as top priority is given to the project. The task of forging a North Atlantic military force for the defense of Western Europe eventually will be centrally located here. This is the beginning of a tank infantry team assault deep into enemy-held territory. Here in an undisclosed area north of Seoul, an attack order is issued for a tank infantry patrol. After the order is given, extra HE grenades are distributed. During the early dawn of the following morning, armor rendezvous with riflemen. Men of the 3rd Division mount tanks to ride during the initial phase of the patrol's advance. Mission of the tank infantry team, cross Imjin River, probe communist defenses beyond the 38th parallel, and report back on his dispositions and equipment. Test his strength, but do not become decisively committed. Withdraw when information is secured. This is a reconnaissance in force. All roads leading into enemy territory are heavily mined. Tanks take to the Imjin River bed, shallow here where it crosses a 38th parallel to avoid red mines. Abandoned communist trucks are found in the river. On the far side of the Imjin, the infantrymen dismount onto North Korean soil and prepare to move out. The patrol moves forward over the innumerable hills into which the enemy forces are dug in. Red fields of fire are not yet brought to bear on the assaulting troops. An enemy position is engaged. Extra grenades issued the night before now come in handy as the riflemen close with a defensive outpost. After the outpost defenses are overrun, the tank infantry team reorganizes and continues the advance. Incoming small arms fire and mortar rounds are beginning to slow down the speed of the patrol's forward movement. The troops are cautious not to become decisively engaged. Red resistance increases as the patrol fights into a small village located on the Kaigan Mainline Railroad, which runs between Seoul and Pyongyang. Making sure their flanks are protected, the tank infantry team punches into the village and destroys communist installations. By late afternoon, this reconnaissance in force completes its mission and returns safely to its base. That was the 8th Army's one-two punch, the infantry tank team. The Chinese and North Koreans got to know it very well as time went on. Now we'd like you to meet another man from the 1st Cavalry Division, Warrant Officer Sam Putterbaugh. Well, Sam, 
What was your job with the regiment? You're a warrant officer, and you're wearing the combat infantry badge. That's a little unusual, isn't it? Yes, it is, Carl, but not all warrant officers are pencil pushers. When we got to Korea, our high rate of casualties amongst the officers, my battalion commander had to utilize what he had, so I was used as a combat platoon leader, and that made me eligible for the combat infantry badge. Well, evidently, Sam, you've done pretty well in that job, too. You're wearing the Bronze Star with Cluster. Well, you saw action in World War II, didn't you? Yes, I did, Carl. Well, ha have we seen a lot of improvements since that time? Yes, we have, especially in the logistical problems. When we first got to Korea, we were short food, water, clothing, ammunition. But when I left Korea in July, the front line troops were getting one hot meal a day. Also, the quartermaster had came out with a new assault ration, which every mission that we went out on as a reconnaissance force or any mission like that, we were given this ration and it's adequate for one meal for that type of a mission. Well, Sam, how about improvements in the medical field? If a man is wounded today, he stands a much better chance of staying alive, doesn't he? But yes, they have. The field hospitals, the medical corps, has put up to as close to the front line as possible. When a man has a serious casualty on the front line, he is immediately evacuated to that field hospital where he is given the best medical care it's possible for a soldier to get. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you were a tanker in World War II, right, Sam? Yes, I was, Carl. Well, a lot of these men coming back from Korea tell us this is not very good country for tank fighting. How do you feel about that? I disagree with that statement very much. When we first got to Korea, we had no tanks, and, and the Chinese and the rest of them were able to push our troops back on several occasions. And the first time, the North Koreans pushed us back to the Naktong River. In August, when the 70th tank came over, we were able to hold those positions and also to have a tank task force break through and go 123 miles in one day. Mm. Now, on the map of Korea, if you look at the west coast, the plains from Seoul to Pyongyang into Shinan Po is all flat plateau country, and tanks can be utilized there very much. Well, that's, that's on the west coast, but how about the east? The terrain there is a little rougher, isn't it? Yes, sir, Carl, but they're being used in the east, too, but not in big forays, but breakthrough points where the infantry goes through would take a mile or two. But no infantryman like to, man likes to go out without a tank going along with him or a platoon of tanks because they're a very good morale factor to have around with that much firepower. Well, Sam, how about the British? They had some tanks over there too, didn't they? Yes, sir, Carl. The British have a 50-ton tank being mm. used in Korea. And when we were forced back the first time from North Korea, it was used as a rear guard. And it's being used very efficiently against the North Korean and Chinese troops today. So I can't see how anybody could say that tank cannot be used in Korea in a manner that they were used in World War II. Well, how about a recon mission? Do you use tanks on those a great deal? Yes, they do. The M24 and the M46 is being used in Korea on recon missions and used effectively. And the infantry likes to have them when they go out on them. Right, Sam. Well, back in uh, April of 1951, a Signal Corps cameraman went with the tankers in a recon mission. Let's see his report. After receiving an order to clear an area near the 38th parallel of communist snipers and to search roads for landmines, a detail of a reconnaissance company prepares for its mission. Weapons are loaded and a final check of equipment is made. The tank convoy gets underway. This roadway has already been cleared of mines. The men keep alert for enemy snipers. All bridges over streams and rivers have been destroyed by the withdrawing communist forces. Tanks ford streams at the shallowest points. Foot troops precede the tanks, searching for landmines. A culvert bridge blasted by retreating reds halts the advance momentarily, but not for long. Engineer troops measure the distance to estimate bridging materials required to span the gully. In no mood to wait, a tank bypasses the wrecked bridge and presses out a detour. The tonnage of the tank smashes a new road that leads through a small village on the far side.
this Jeep in four-wheel drive and shifted in low, low, bogs down despite a persistent attempt to move through the giant rocks. The much heavier tank returns to smooth out the steep approaches and the rocky terrain. Now the Jeep moves over the detour and out the other side over the tank-made path. Teamwork pays off. Remember the sign on the American roads that said, beware, soft shoulder? Well, here's what it can mean in Korea. Another tank moves up to the disabled one, but can be of no assistance. Crew members sweat it out while their tank balances precariously. Chinese surrender leaflets are found in the vicinity of the disabled tank, and tankers read the propaganda through curious but distrusting eyes. The usual reaction to these propaganda leaflets is the traditional but appropriate nuts. After radioing for a tank retriever, the recon detail moves on to accomplish its mission. Those were the events that comprised the big picture from March 20th to April 20th, 1951. Our thanks to Warrant Officer Sam Putterbaugh and TSC Jim Vines of the 1st Cavalry Division for being with us. Next week, the big picture will show the United Nations forces withdrawing in the face of a red offensive. You'll see the Lincoln Line established north of Seoul. You'll see our troops hold on to that line and later break out in an air ground assault. And you'll hear from another combat veteran, an army soldier who saw, as it happened, a part of the big picture. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. is war. War and its masses. War and its men. War and its machines. Together they form the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. The big picture is a report to you from your army, an army committed by you, the people of the United States, to stop communist aggression wherever it may strike. The big picture traces the course of events in the Korean campaign through first-hand reports of our combat veterans, and through film produced by the Army Signal Corps, photographed by combat cameramen. These are the men who daily record on film the big picture as it happens, where it happens. Today, the big picture shows the United Nations forces withdraw in the face of a red offensive. You'll see the Lincoln Line established. You'll see our troops hold on to that line and later break out in an air ground assault. You'll meet an Army nurse, Captain Molly Younger of Kansas City, Missouri. You'll meet an Army medic, a man who served with the Army's 3rd Infantry Division, Sergeant Mike Perputnik of McAdoo, Pennsylvania. And now, let's go back to April 20th, 1951. During the period 20 April to 20 May, the Communists launched two phases of their expected spring offensive. On 23 April, the Reds jump off on their first phase, hitting strongest above Seoul. UN troops are forced to withdraw south, 
as British and Belgian contingents hold off the communists in a spectacular rearguard engagement. A secondary action of this phase hits in the Hua Chan Reservoir area. By 30 April, UN forces cease their withdrawal and set up the Lincoln defense line a few miles north of Seoul. In the central sector, UN troops withdraw south of the Pukhan River, and in the east, ROK forces pull back to Yangyang. From 1 May to 16 May, there is only minor enemy activity as the communists build up for the second phase, and UN forces recover some ground north of Seoul. UN air forces strike at targets of opportunity. The second phase begins on 17 May with the heaviest attack in the central sector southwest of Inji and east of Chonchon. Heavy casualties are inflicted on the Reds in this area. On 20 May, the UN forces shorten their line north of Seoul, strengthen positions in the central sector, and move to plug a gap caused by the collapse of two ROK divisions. In the Imjin River area, soldiers of two combat teams quickly break camp. These combat teams are composed of British, Belgian, Filipino, and American troops. What may be the last meal for a long time is grabbed as a report is received of a large enemy force which has crossed the nearby Imjin. These UN troops start their withdrawal according to plan. Mortars blast at the approaching Reds who threaten to cut off the combat teams. The withdrawal starts south, down the main highway that passes through Weijonbu to Seoul. Hit by an enemy shell, this UN truck tractor burns. Due to machine gun and mortar fire from infiltrated enemy troops, the convoy halts. Men take cover and wait until the way has been cleared. The long convoy moves southward again with its cargo of men and equipment. The communist offensive was expected and nothing of use is left behind. En route, battalion commanders discuss the situation. In Weijon Bu, a sign aptly states the result of war's devastation on the town. Tanks and trucks race through the battered town to pick up units of the combat team, which are redeployed in new defense line south of Weijonbu. Later, a battalion of infantry plods wearily through the rice paddies. After fighting off the Chinese all through the night, they slog through the pelting rain to new defensive positions. Their fatigue is apparent in every step. A little more water doesn't seem to matter much as they wade a swollen stream. Full advantage is taken of the chance for a short rest before fighting off the Reds again. Rain-soaked troops hold rear guard positions covering the withdrawal. This is the third major Red offensive of the conflict. The first was the initial North Korean aggression last June, and the second, the full-scale intervention of the Chinese Communists on 26 November. Our 155s blast evacuated Weijong Bu. Withdrawal continues as UN firepower takes a terrible toll of Chinese. Further south, nearing Seoul, the last UN vehicles cross a bridge south of Yapyong. Men of an engineer battalion pour gasoline on the bridge, which has also been mined with TNT.
bridge is destroyed. Communist human sea tactics against our superior firepower is costing them dearly for each mile they advance. This was Korea in April and May of 1951. A bit later, we'll return to the riflemen in action. But first, we want you to meet an army nurse who saw duty in Korea. She's Captain Molly Younger of Kansas City, Missouri. And Molly served with a frontline surgical team. Now, how did this team operate? What did it do? The 8076 Mobile Surgical Unit, activated in July, sent to Korea and assigned to the 24th Division. And there they were about 10 to 18 miles uh, below the clearing company. The, uh, as the first aid men picked up the casualties, gave them first aid, sent them to the clearing company, and from the clearing company were sent to our unit, the uh, mobile surgical unit, for further treatment. Now, this is the first time that uh, a wounded soldier was given definitive treatment this close to the front. Is that right? That's right. It certainly must have saved a lot of lives, <coughs> Molly. Yes, it did. And uh, after the uh, treatment at our hospital, they were evac uh, evacuated by train, helicopters, and ambulances to the... Uh, Evac Hospital, which was at Pusan at that time, and from Pusan, they were sent to Japan and then to the States. Now, how many months were you in Korea, Molly? Six months. Well, certainly in that time, you moved around a great deal, didn't you? How did you get around? Well, we had um, 32 vehicles assigned to the unit, and uh, most of our trips was by convoy. Well, how many of those were ambulances? Well, we had 18 amb 14 ambulances, that's right. Well, how about the, uh, the weather in Korea? You saw a lot of different temperatures. Yes, in the beginning it was a little hot. Of course, we didn't have time to think about the heat at that time. And uh, later on, though, it uh, was getting a little bit cold. A little oh. bit too cold for some of us, but we remedied that situation, too. Mm -hmm. Well, Molly, did these extreme temperatures uh, hurt your operations any? Well, the heat wasn't, uh, didn't uh, hinder anything but the cold. Uh, due to the fact that the uh, were set up in tents in these buildings that were not heated, we did have some oil stoves that we tried to set up and work under those conditions. Mm -hmm. Well, Molly, uh, when did the surgical team see its roughest action in Korea? Well, I'd say right in the beginning, in July, August, and September. When we really sustained a lot of losses, didn't we? Yes, and uh, there were long hours of duty for all of us. We worked from 18 to 24 hours, 36 hours, round the clock. This was the whole crew? The entire crew stayed on. And well, how many operations could you do at one time, Molly? Well, our first setup there, we had, we could um, make good use of our six tables. We had six operating room tables, and uh, they were in full swing at all times. And uh, patients were taken care of as soon as they came in. And um, we had three anestas, and some of us could hold down two or three tables at a time. That was your job. You handled That's the right. anesthesia, right? That's right. Well, Molly, certainly there are a lot out there, a lot of girls watching this program who we would like to see become Army nurses. Now, this is your opportunity to talk to them, Molly. There they are. Yes, we need nurses, and very badly, especially nurses with critical MOSs, specialties, is the uh, NP. MOS, the surgical, and most of all, anestas. Molly, we're asking for nurses, asking these girls to join you in being an Army nurse. We're not doing what the Army used to do and say, uh, join and see the world. In fact, we've given them a pretty rough picture right here. But I think more important than anything else is the fact that you get a great deal of satisfaction out of your job, don't you? Yes, we do. We save lives and can't think of anything more important than to save lives. Right, Molly, we certainly can't either. Well, now, uh, you told us a few moments ago that when you received these wounded men, the only treatment they had received was from the frontline aid man, right? That's right. Well, how was that treatment? Well, it was uh, really remarkable, considering the circumstance they had uh, applied the treatment, administered the treatment. They uh, used the... Uh, Improvised a lot of times, the uh, tourniquets and splints and used string and rope and everything else for tourniquets, in fact. 
But um, they all carried their uh, sulfur packs, and they, but that was the first initial treatment. Well, Molly, a little later in our program, we're going to meet one of these medical aid men. But now, let's go back to the action in Korea, April and May of 1951. At the end of the first week of the communist spring offensive, Allied units withdraw to defensive positions north of Seoul. In the western sector, where red pressure is heaviest, trucks loaded with troops move rapidly south. UN forces have broken contact with the enemy all along most of the front. As soon as defending forces have taken positions behind the Lincoln Line, final line of defense between Weijongbu and Seoul, engineers plant an extensive minefield. The anti-tank mines are armed as the field is completed. Anti-personnel mines will also be laid. To augment the minefields, barbed wire entanglements are constructed by the engineers. Working quickly, the wire is strung and stretched taut. A 75 millimeter recoilless rifle covers the valley which the Reds must cross to reach the Lincoln Line. Observers of an ROK division use this high point to advantage and keep close watch on the opposing hills. Artillery is called for to give relief to a UN tank column under enemy fire in the valley. HE shells blast the distant hills, giving support and cover to the withdrawing tanks. The armored patrol is returning to the Lincoln Line after contacting two Chinese battalions. A tank nudges a Korean hut aside to clear the field of fire for a roadblock. As Allied forces retire behind the Lincoln Line, tanks are put into use as defensive weapons. The heavy firepower of the artillery is ready. wait in emplaced positions to add their forceful punch. In the heart of Seoul, on the grounds of the Capitol building, 155 howitzers fire a sharp warning at the advancing Chinese. Artillerymen improved their emplacements within view of the capital. Although earlier the South Korean government warned the populace to leave, almost half a million remained in the city, showing confidence in our ability to hold despite the growing menace of the Red Advance. The government was finally forced to order the evacuation. Only then did the people leave. The UN troops remained on the Lincoln Line to write the next chapter in the defense of Seoul. field hospital in Korea. Full facilities must be available here for the first phase of treatment of the wounded. It's the critical phase. An emergency shipment of blood coming in. Whole blood, the doctor's best friend. Oft times the wounded man's only chance for life. Donated in New York or San Francisco or St. Louis, typed, stored, and shipped with the strictest scientific care, it's here where it's needed. After first aid treatment and an aid station, wounded men are brought to the field hospital. Here they are given only the necessary treatment to put them in shape for speedy evacuation to a base hospital where every benefit of modern medicine and surgery is available. Almost every wounded man has lost too much blood. He needs replacement quickly to overcome or prevent shock, to make his system responsive to treatment, or capable of withstanding the shock of an operation. If a wounded man can be evacuated to a base hospital in good shape, he's as good as safe.
drop by drop, a young man's precious life is saved for his loved ones, for his country. The gifts of blood must never stop. Troops of the UN forces move along a barbed wire barricade on a ridge near the town of Tokso, part of the line of defense against the communists in this sector. As further determined to the mass assaults of the Chinese, an anti-personnel minefield is planted just beyond the UN-held line. Trip wires are adjusted from the stakes to the mines, which have an effective danger radius of 75 yards. A pressure of nine pounds against the trip wire will explode one of these lethal traps. Until the field is completely sewn, each wire is marked by a lightweight plate. On the road bordering the minefield, tanks and infantrymen of a recon company survey the defense line. The next morning, the road is strewn with the bodies of 24 members of an enemy patrol which tried to infiltrate during the night. One red soldier still lives. Men of the recon company cautiously move the wounded man onto the road from the gully. The communist is apparently in great pain, but the combat-wise soldiers used to the tricks of a treacherous enemy, search him for concealed weapons or possible booby traps. In the shelter of one of our tanks, first aid is given to the wounded man. From a vantage point atop a hill, a machine gunner watches the valley below as his assistant adjusts his fire through a BC scope. An observer checks the terrain as a gunner fires at an enemy position in a village ahead. Smoke rises from the battered town. Troops of the United Nations maintain their vigilance and refuse to give up ground to the communist hordes without exacting a heavy toll for every foot of ground. A returning tank brings news that the infiltrating Reds have been routed from the village. I'd like to tell you about a very important part of our big picture, the frontline aid men. These are the men who so often are saluted by the men they serve, the riflemen, for the work they do in caring for our wounded under fire, many times while they themselves are hit. Here's Sergeant Mike Proputnik, who saw duty with the Army's 3rd Division in Korea. Mike was an aid man there. Well, let's talk about these aid men, Mike. Uh, you travel right with the rifle company, don't you? That's correct. There's four aid men and a, right, and a litter team along with the rifle company. We go and attack and uh, take care of the wounded and evacuate them as soon as possible. How about the, the terrain over there? That makes it a little rough for the evacuation, doesn't it? It does. We uh, look over the terrain before we go in and uh, find the quickest way possible for evacuation that can be done. Well, how do you get them off these hills, Mike? Well, we have these Korean uh, litter bearers, civilians, and uh, they can move out a lot faster than we can. They know the terrain also. They know how to climb those hills. That's correct. Well, now, what equipment do you have with you to treat these wounded men? Well, uh, we have a first aid kit, which handles uh, emergency treatment along with the uh, company. Yes, it is. This is it right here? Yeah, this right. is it right here. And with it, we've got the first aid packet, which each soldier uses, along, uh, which he carries with himself, so they can... This is right on his belt, right. every combat soldier. And we've got the triangle bandage, which can be used as a sling, or it can be used for anything else if necessary. Mm -hmm. 
And then we've got the compressed bandage, which we use on larger wounds to cover areas which the first aid packet don't cover. And then we've got our tags, which we mark our patients with if we have the time, which tells of the treatment and uh, when they've been treated. Do you have time to use this? Sometimes we don't have the time, so they're treated, treated or rather marked later on back, further on the back down the line. What, what do you have on here, just to show what his, his name, his serial number, and the extent of his wounds? Is that it, Mike? That's it, and also the treatment which he gets mm -hmm. from the aid man. Right. Well, Mike, uh, there's an old expression in the Army, the pill roller. Certainly that does not apply to the frontline aid man. No, it doesn't. Uh, the frontline aid man wouldn't be called a pill roller. He uh, hasn't got time to roll pills. He uh, takes care of the wounded and evacuates them as soon as possible, whenever it can be done. Yes, and he's doing some very important medical work, Mike. He's, he's giving this man the first treatment he receives. It's got to be good and it's got to be quick. That's right. And while you're treating this man over here, or two or three over here, you get another call from medic from the other side of the hill, huh? That's right. Right. Well, Mike, we certainly will not use that expression with a frontline aid man, pill roller, because we have all the respect in the world for, for you men, and certainly the men we've had on our program, the riflemen, feel the same way. And now let's go back to Korea, of April and May of 1951, and see an air ground assault. Just north of Seoul, Allied planes smash Chinese columns massed for an attack a scant thousand yards beyond our main line of defense. Pouring down the historic invasion routes from Munsan and Weijongbu, the Reds try to break through to Seoul. Officers observe the effectiveness of UN air power back in the skies after days of rain as it plasters enemy concentrations building up for their much heralded May Day attack on Seoul. The planes smother the target with machine gun fire, rockets, and napalm. It's boring. even the fanatical communists can stand against this sort of coordinated defense. With the full Allied power shattering their formations, the enemy's planned May Day offensive is stalled before it starts. The 
Those are the events that comprise the big picture from April 20th to May 20th, 1951. Our thanks to Captain Molly Younger and Sergeant Mike Propotnik for being with us. Next week, the big picture will show the 8th Army answer the Red Spring Offensive with a powerful attack all along the line. And you'll meet two combat veterans who saw, as it happened, a part of the big picture. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then.